All right. Uh, good afternoon. Um, the Secretary General is right now on his way back to uh, New York, where he'll land later uh, this afternoon, early this evening. Uh, before um, this morning, he co-hosted uh, the International Conference on Climate Resilient Pakistan, along with the Prime Minister of Pakistan, Shabazz Sharif. In his remarks during the opening session, the Secretary General called on the international community to match the heroic response of the people of Pakistan with its own efforts and massive investments to strengthen their communities for the future. During a press encounter with the Prime Minister, the Secretary General said that support for Pakistan should happen in three fundamental ways, with massive investments to rebuild homes and infrastructure, to jumpstart jobs in agriculture, and to ensure access to technology and knowledge to withstand future disasters. He also renewed his call for climate action and reform of the global financial system. The conference, in fact, just wrapped up a few minutes ago, and we will be sharing with you by email the chair, the co-chair's um, summary with more details on the pledges made today. During the conference, delegations recalled their assistance to the immediate relief efforts and affirmed their support to the people of Pakistan for a resilient recovery, rehabilitation, and reconstruction. Delegations expressed their solidarity and announced commitments of financial support to the realization of the uh, objectives and priorities at, at outlined in the 4RF, as well as the ongoing humanitarian efforts. Taken as a whole, these commitments total more than nine billion US dollars from both bilateral and multilateral partners. And for a first time in a multilateral settings, de developing countries pledged um, pledged more than half of the amount needed to support Pakistan's resilient recovery, rehabilitation, reconstruction framework. Further announcements for in-kind support were made by a number of delegations. Turning to Brazil, um, during his press encounter today in Geneva, uh, the Secretary General said he was shocked by the image images he had seen on television uh, yesterday coming out of Brasilia but he emphasized that he trusts Brazil and Brazilian institutions. The Secretary General said he is absolutely convinced that Brazil will deal with this situation with adequate accountability and that the democratic functioning of Brazil will move on. He added that he is totally confident that Brazil will be at the level necessary to deal with this crisis. Um, as you have seen yesterday evening in a tweet, he also condemned the assault on the democratic institutions of Brazil, stressing that the will of the Brazilian people and the country's institutions must be respected. In a statement, the UN team on the ground also condemned any attack of this nature and called on authorities to prioritize restoring order and upholding democracy and the rule of law. Uh, I have a statement on Sudan. Uh, the Secretary General welcomes the launch of the final phase in the political process towards restoring a civilian-led uh, transition in Sudan. This step builds on the progress achieved on the signing of the political framework agreed on December 5, 2022. Marks an important step forward towards realizing the aspirations of the Sudanese people for democracy, peace, and sustainable development. The United Nations, through the trilateral mechanism comprised of the UN Integrated Assistance Mission in Sudan, uh, the African Union, and the Intergovernmental Authority on Development, otherwise known as EGAD, remains committed to supporting the progress and to help secure a final political agreement over the coming weeks. To ensure a lasting settlement, the Secretary General underscores the importance of including the broadest array of Sudanese stakeholders, including women, youth, and civil society. He also urges key stakeholders which did not sign the December 5th agreement to join the political process. Finally, he stressed the importance of strong, coordinated international support to the political process under the framework of the trilateral mechanism. Uh, just heading south to South Sudan, uh, as intercommunal conflict persists in the greater Jonglei area, the UN mission there, otherwise known as UNMIS, 
said today it is continuing its effort to restore to help restore calm and assist displaced people. Peacekeepers have also begun constructing a 115-kilometer road connecting the towns of Pibor and Labrab in Greater Jongle, which is expected to be ready by April. The mission confirms that upon completion, this latest effort will lead to some 420 kilometers of new or fully rehabilitated roadways that connect several key towns and villages and will aid mandate implementation in the work of humanitarian partners by improving access to areas, including during the rainy season. Uh, you will have seen a bit, a couple of hours ago, we issued a statement uh, on Syria uh, short, uh, following the Security Council's unanimous vote uh, this morning on the cross-border uh, resolution. The Secretary General takes note of today's decision by the Council to confirm the extension of its authorization of the UN cross-border humanitarian operation, which remains an indispensable lifeline for 4.1 million people in Northwest Syria. The decision to confirm the extension of that authorization for an additional six months comes as humanitarian needs have reached the highest level since the start of the conflict in 2011, with people in Syria grappling with harsh winter and a cholera outbreak. The UN is committed to pursuing all avenues to provide aid and protection through the safest and most direct and efficient routes. Humanitarian access across Syria, including through cross-border and cross-line operations, must be expanded and humanitarian activities be broadened through investment in early recovery projects. The Secretary General urges Security Council members and others to continue supporting humanitarian partners' efforts to deliver assistance to those who need it throughout Syria. Also on Syria and um, related to humanitarian aid, uh, yesterday a UN interagency cross-line convoy of 18 trucks carried nearly 600 metric tons of humanitarian supplies from Aleppo to Sarmada. These supplies included fuel, water, sanitation items, health kits, medicines, education, child protection, and dignity kits. This is a 10th line cross-line convoy in line with the UN interagency operational plan developed after the adoption of Resolution 2585 in July of 2021, and the fifth since the adoption of the Resolution 2642 in July of last year. Our colleagues say that humanitarian conditions continue to deteriorate in the Northwest due to the ongoing hostilities and a worsening economic crisis. Some 80% of 4.1 million people rely on aid to meet their most basic needs are women and children. While an important complement, uh, the cross-line operation cannot substitute for the size and scope of the massive cross-border operation, which reaches 2.7 million Syrians every month with vital aid, including food and vaccines. A uh, quick note on Ukraine, where um, on Saturday, uh, UN humanitarian colleagues were able to send a convoy with life-saving assistance to Orykiv and Zaporizhka Oblast to support people who have not been able to access, uh, we've not been able to access due to intense fighting. The supplies on the convoy were from the UN Migration Organization, UN Refugee Agency, UNICEF, and WHO. Uh, just on Cote d'Ivoire, as we made clear over the weekend, we welcome the return home from Mali of the 46 Ivoirian soldiers and commend Togo and the region for all their efforts in securing this outcome. And a quick note from Burundi, where the acting resident coordinator, John Akbor, is stepping up it's uh, the UN team is stepping up its response efforts as health authorities declare a cholera outbreak last week. W, uh, WHO and UNICEF and our partners have distributed drinking water and installed water bladders to 5,700 households in impacted communities, also supplying 7,500 households with chlorine tablets. They also help disinfect um, 7,500 households in public spaces, including health centers, schools, and markets. Around 2,300 households received water and sanitation kits, such as jerry cans, soaps, and buckets. UNICEF and WHO also provided nine treatment kits and two testing kits to health authorities with the capacity to treat up to, up to 900 cholera cases. Our team is also supporting radio stations to boost preventing mes preventive messages, mobilize partners for door-to-door -door sensitization and hygiene promotion. Uh, lastly, some good news uh, from our friend at the World Meteorological Organization and UN Environment Program. We don't often get good news from them. They tell us that the ozone layer is on track to recover within four decades. 
In a new report, a UN-backed scientific panel confirmed that the phase-out of nearly 99% of banned ozone-depleting substances has succeeded in safeguarding the ozone layer, leading to a notable recovery of the ozone layer in the upper stratosphere and, and decreased human exposure to harmful ultraviolet rays from the sun. UNEP says the impact of the Montreal Protocol, the international treaty designed to protect the ozone layer, which entered to force in 87, uh, not in 1789, excuse me, in 1989, cannot be overstressed. The panel also examined new technologies, such as geoengineering for the first time, and warned that the, of the unintended impacts on the ozone layer caused by methods like stratospheric aerosol injection. Does anyone know what stratospheric aerosol injection is? <laughs> Whoever does can get, ask a question, otherwise I'm leaving. All right, Edie, you can take a whack at it. I'm not Apparently taking. It's, it's injection, I'm, injecting gases in the stratosphere to try to cool the atmosphere. I'm glad. I'm glad there's some scientific experts yeah. sending you uh, yes. whatever. <laughs> um, a follow-up on that: Does the Secretary General have any reaction to that report? Well, I, I, I think it shows what is achievable when the international community comes together, agrees on a treaty, and implements that treaty. Um, the Montreal Protocol is a success story, um, and it should be an example uh, to member states of what can be achieved uh, when there is political will. Um, thanks. My, my question was actually about Iran and the government imposing new death sentences and uh, executions. We cannot condemn enough the use of the death penalty. Uh, it is something that uh, the Secretary General has always spoken out against and will continue to speak out against wherever and whenever uh, it is implemented. Michelle and then James. Thanks, Steph. Question on Afghanistan. Um, over the weekend, I believe the Central Bank of Afghanistan uh, said that um, their bulk cash shipments into Afghanistan had been stopped by the UN, um, or oh, I don't actually I don't know by who, but they just said bulk cash shipments had been stopped. Is that accurate? I'm not aware uh, of the cash shipments having been uh, been stopped. Uh, as you know, we have been sending in cash uh, into Afghanistan uh, to ensure that all of our humanitarian programs are able to, uh, to work. Um, the cash is deposited into the central bank. Uh, and and so, excuse me, I'm so sorry. The cash is not uh, brought... None of the cash brought into Afghanistan is deposited in the Central Bank of Afghanistan, nor is it provided to the government for distribution to the UN. Um, it is placed in, des in designated UN accounts um, in a private bank for the sole use of the United Nations. So to clear up the Monday morning lack of clarity, uh, we do bring in cash into Afghanistan. It does not go into the Central Bank. And those shipments haven't stopped? I'm not aware that they have stopped. Okay, and just a quick follow-up on the vote this morning. Did the Secretary-General speak with Ambassador Nabenzia at all ahead of the vote on uh, Syria? I didn't see it on his call logs, uh, so I, I don't know. But he, the SG was up early this morning and, I, and got on a plane as soon as he got off the, as he finished the Pakistan conference. James. A couple of follow-ups uh, and then a question. Um, on Iran, you're condemning it in the strongest terms from this podium, but what is the Secretary General doing? Who is he speaking to in the Iranian leadership about this continual stream of executions almost daily? Well, I mean, the, um, the fact that the, the message publicly and privately is the same. We are uh, being very public about our, our stance. Uh, every chance the Secretary General, uh, uh, every time the Secretary General has spoken to an Iranian 
uh, officials. He has uh, expressed his concern about the, the overall situation uh, regarding the, the demonstrations that, that we have seen, among others. And on Mali and the pardoning uh -huh. of the Ivorian soldiers, I mean, I know that they were not technically part of the UN mission, MINUSMA, but they had some sort of ancillary role. Can you clear up for us now that they are pardoned what the problem was? Because clearly somewhere the system broke down um, and pe the right people weren't told the job that they were doing. Can you explain what happened for the sake of transparency and for lessons learned? Uh, I don't have any further information to share with you on that. I will see what I can get for you for the sake okay. of transparency uh, lessons uh, learned. Okay. Um, and South Sudan, a story that's across the internet, um, which seems amusing, which is the president, yeah. Salva Kiir, yeah, yeah. wetting himself at a public event filmed by state television. And six staff, though, of the state television have now been detained. Um, surely it's the duty of the media to cover everything that pub public figures do, their successes, their failures, their incompetence, dare I say it, even their incontinence. What is the Secretary General's reaction to these arrests? Look, uh not for us to comment on, on the, actual, uh, the actual incident, but it is very concerning uh, that these journalists uh, have been detained uh, for doing their job. Uh, and I think our, our mission on the ground is trying to get more details to their, their whereabouts and to ensure that they are treated properly. Madame. Monsieur, uh, two minutes ago, you told us that when the international community comes together it do good, right? Why is the international community not coming together to stop the killings in Iran of those young people? Why not? Uh, ask, ask 193 ambassadors. I mean, I, I've told you what our position is. Ask all, you have 193 permanent representatives here. Ask each one of them. Deji. Uh, Steph, first, a couple of follow-ups. First, on the pass of the resolution, uh, the statement read that the Secretary General take notes of this uh, resolution uh, result. Does he welcome this resolution or not? Look, it is obviously much better than the alternative, right, if we did not have a resolution. Uh, and it allows us to continue um, to provide essential aid through cross-border. As we also continue doing cross line, as we did uh, just uh, Sunday, I think what is always more helpful to us in all of these situations is to have longer mandates because uh, it helps. It helps with with planning, uh, and it helps with um, uh, longer term planning uh, in terms of, of all sorts of resources. But it, it is obviously uh, a positive development uh, that the resolution was approved, and I should un underscore approved unanimously. Uh, and today, the Russian ambassador, Mr. Nebenzia, also said uh, in his uh, explanation of vote, he said that uh, it's unfair to have the early recovery projects, half of them, f I, if I remember correctly, 50% of the early recovery projects were in Idlib. He said it's unfair. Uh, any response from the UN on that? I have no, no particular comment. Obviously, the how... Uh how the recovery, the, the early recovery uh, in Syria goes uh, should be uh, directed by, uh, uh, by the Syrian, in terms of the, the direction uh, by the Syrian authorities. Now, my, my, no, this is now my question, sorry. Well, um, sorry, what, was the first, what were the first two statements? Uh, Follow-ups. No, right. Okay. okay. <laughs> so my question is on the uh, situation of uh, Palestine, uh, because I remember that the, the, the Secretary General issued statement said people, that everybody should step away from the provocation uh, actions, right? Uh, but for the past, past weekend, the Israeli uh, security minister uh, Mr. Ben Gvir, who visited the Holy Sa ho the, the te uh, Temple Mountain, uh, ordered police to remove Palestine flags from public spaces, and also the Israeli government revoked the travel permits of Palestinian foreign minister. Do you consider this a step away from provocation? Look on the uh, the. Um 
the directive regarding the flag is something that is very concerning, uh, concerning to us. Uh, and I think it would fall into uh, the category of these um, decisions uh, that do not help uh, bringing Palestinians and Israelis uh, closer. On the issue of the, of the sanctions uh, placed by the Israeli government, reportedly placed by the Israeli government on the foreign minister, uh, we're speaking to our colleagues uh, in Jerusalem to try to get more, a bit more clarity. Uh, thank you, Steph. Just a quick follow-up on Michelle's question. The private bank you mentioned for the money to be deposited for humanitarian aid, is it based in Afghanistan? Yeah, I mean, it's an Afghan bank. I mean, we have to use a, we have to use a local bank uh, where we have accounts for UN uh, operations. Um, and from there, we're able to withdraw, uh, withdraw money uh, and pay the, pay the staff and, and, and so on. Uh, do you have any concerns that the Taliban regime might interfe interfere in uh, well, I mean, that so, bank? So far, we've bank? been able to uh, use this system without any uh, interference that I know of. Um, and the money goes into a bank like it would go into any other bank. But we're obviously following that money extremely closely. Gregory. Uh, thank you, Stefan. Uh, uh, today, the Minister of Agriculture of Turkey has said that uh, during the function of a grain initiative, only 5.4% uh, of Ukrainian grain uh, will deliver to, to poor countries. So do you have any to comment? And the second one, please. How can you estimate uh, uh, the current situation of getting access of uh, Russian food and fertilizer for export? And so uh, maybe are there any plans for new contact between uh, the UN and Russian representatives on this issue? Thank oh. you. On your last point, uh, our colleague Rebecca Greenspan and the Secretary General and others are continuously focused on trying to remove barriers uh, and impediments uh, to the exports of Russian grain and fertilizer, which are not sanctioned. It involves a lot of parties, public sector, private sector. Uh, we are continuously pushing for progress in that, uh, in, in that regard. On the issue of where the grain is going, uh, I would encourage you to look, take a look at the uh, helpful updates that our colleagues in the um, uh, Joint Operation Center, Coordination Center in Istanbul put out. Uh, it, it's a breakdown of where the ships go. Uh, I think what is also important to keep in, in, in mind are two, two things. One, often uh, grain is going to one place to be milled and, and transformed into flour, which is then re-exported to other places a number of times in the developing world. We do not have visibility on the, the commercial transactions that happen once the grain leaves um, the ship. These are commercial transactions, right? We do not uh, interfere with the commercial contracts placed between uh, Ukrainian grain exporters and the importers and the shippers, right? But it is also important to note that the overall um, uh, project has uh, led to a decrease in uh, global food prices uh, at the wholesale level, uh, which is helping uh, people around the world. Okay, Paulina, welcome back. Deji's accusing me of censoring Ms. Fasulo. Linda, please, sorry, I didn't see you. Um, thank you, Steph, welcome back. I did see you, I did not see you raise your hand. Put it that way. <laughs> I just have a quick question. Yep. Um, I believe traditionally the SG makes a visit to Washington in J January, at the beginning of the year, generally I think late January. I was wondering if that uh, trip is expected or being planned. Uh, I'm not aware of any trip uh, being expected. Uh, I'm not sure uh, if that, I mean, as, as much as I am a traditionalist, I'm not sure uh, uh, when that tradition is, that tradition is keeping going, but I will let you know if there's a, a trip, a trip planned. I'm trying not to quote Fiddler on the